I'm going to begin this evening with kind of a tough story. And I'm not going to tell you this story because I want to elicit your pity, but because it's my story. And I think good stories are important to share. And I think it's important to be honest. And part of that honesty is going to involve me using some language that historically has been considered uh, slurs against persons who are members of the LGBTQ community. And I don't use these words because I think we should use them far from it, really. I use them, though, because they're a part of my story, because I heard them, and because they were told to me. And again, I think it's important to be honest. So tonight, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be honest with you and to tell you my story. So it was the late summer, 1996. I was finishing eighth grade and about to go into high school. And one evening, as, I really, as the reality of impending high school started to kind of sink in, I was, I was laying in my bedroom under these maroon comfort, this maroon comforter that I had at the time. And in just the, the living room, just a few feet away, my mom and my dad were talking, and I could hear the TV going, their conversations mixing with my sort of interior conversations that I was having with myself. Conversations that were really keeping a pretty unbelievable fear at bay. Because like I said, I was, I was really afraid of going to high school. And I was afraid because I actually kind of realized that I was different. But at that time, as a 14-year-old, I didn't really know exactly what that different meant. But now, in hindsight, I do. You see, I started to realize at that point that I was gay. And I felt like that I needed to have a plan in order to go to high school. So some of those kind of interior conversations that I had with myself went something like this. Now, Travis, don't swing your arms too much when you walk down the hall because, you know, normal guys don't walk like that. Just hold, you know, hold your arms down straight at your sides when you walk through the halls because if you walk funny, people might say something and nobody can never know this. I mean, what should I wear? I mean, like, what do people wear there? What should I look like? I should probably have mom or dad take me down to the, to the store in town and buy some flannel shirts, maybe some old blue jeans. I, I think that's what the normal guys wear. You know, maybe if I look like them, nobody will say anything because no one can ever know. Don't smile too much. Normal guys don't smile a lot. Well, except for at the girls. Uh, yeah, maybe you should flirt. Flirt with all the girls, get really popular with them, and then maybe you'll kind of fit in. Maybe nobody will say anything because, Lord, nobody can know. Well, Travis, you've made good grades all through grammar school. Keep making good grades because if you make good grades, the teachers will like you. And if something happens in the classroom, if somebody says something, then maybe if the teacher's like you, they'll stick up for you. Maybe they'll have your back. Travis, you've got to keep making good grades. Study hard. Who are you going to hang out with? Who's going to be nice to me there? Well, you know, I've grown up in the church, and a lot of the kids that I go to church with, they're going to be at high school with me. I mean, they're nice. They're my friends. But I should probably stick pretty close to them because I don't know who's going to be nice to me. And, you know, the church kids, maybe we can pray together in the morning, and we can, we can be good friends. I think they'll be nice to me, but God, they can never know this. Church, church, God, 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 I don't really want this. I don't want to be different. I don't want to feel different. I just want to be like everybody else. I promise, God, I will be really, really good. I will do everything that I'm supposed to. Just take this from me. I don't want to be different. God, do you, do you hear me? Do you hear me? See, my grammar school years had actually been pretty okay, but also kind of tough. I was made fun of quite a bit. Folks didn't always want to play with me on the playground. Sometimes people called me names. Oftentimes people called me names. One time at a, at a football game when I was in eighth grade, a, a kid forced me in a group of other people. He said, Travis, you're a fag, aren't you? He forced me to admit in front of all these people that I was a fag, right? And that hurt. That was, that was emotionally hurtful. It made me feel very alone. But I never, even in grammar school, felt 
physically afraid, right? I was kind of used to the emotional hurt, but physical hurt wasn't really something that I had experienced. But here I am, I'm going to high school, and you know, as an eighth grader, I had actually heard this story. I don't even know if it was true or not, but I heard this story about another guy who was different at the high school, and he got beat up really bad in the parking lot one day. He had to go to the hospital. He was hurt. That scared me to no end. Again, I was used to the emotional kind of violence, but physical violence really, really scared me. And I felt like if I was going to literally survive high school, I had to make a perfectly constructed plan about how I was going to look, how I was going to walk, how I was going to talk, and who I was going to be with. So my freshman year comes along, and at that time, one of my best friends, her name is Jessie. Uh, and Jessie was a year older than me, which already meant that she had her driver's license. Um, and what that also meant was that Jessie could give me a ride to school in the morning, and then she could give me a ride home after school. And that's nice, right? But one of the things that that really, th I felt like, saved me from was the fact that when I started high school, I was going to have to ride the bus from the high school over to the elementary school where my mom taught. And I was terrified of the prospect of having to ride the bus. I didn't know what was going to happen to me on that bus. I did not want to ride the bus. But Jessie and her friendship and her green Pontiac saved me from that. And in that car to, work, or to school and back was a time that I felt safe, right? And I was with a friend. And we would drive all through Newport, Tennessee, listening to, I'm going to admit it, Spice Girls. And eating more Burger King than any two people really probably ever should eat in any one given period of time. But all throughout those years, before I got my driver's license and could drive, I spent that time in the car with Jessie. But she never knew. I mentioned church a minute ago, and I got really, really involved in church. I was one, a person of faith, but I also felt like that could be a safe place for me. I was at every youth meeting, I was on every mission trip, I was at every youth conference and retreat that you could possibly fathom existed, I was there. Many Sunday mornings I would stand up at the pulpit of a church with quite a few people in the congregation and I would pray about and for so many different things. But no one in that congregation knew of the more earnest prayers that I prayed every night. Prayers for God to take this thing from me. Nobody new. Those really ended up being pretty lonely kind of years. Those were the years that I learned to actually lead two lives, a very internal kind of life and an external one. And I felt like that external, uh, that external narrative that I put out there in front of everybody was very precarious. And that if I made any mistake whatsoever, it felt like the end of the world. Because I felt like if I made a mistake, all that could come crumbling down and people might find out. Being different is hard. And living two different lives is hard. It begins to chip away at your sense of self and at your sense of identity and at your sense of worth. And over many years, over a lot of prayer that began to change in its nature through um, a good bit of therapy and through a lot of conversations with friends, though, things began to improve. Between then and now, um, I've come out to my family, to my community, to you all tonight. <laughs> um, and as a result of that, relationships really changed. Some relationships dissolved. They, they ended. But for the most part, most of my relationships, particularly with my family and my friends, have deepened. And no matter how relationships have changed, I would argue that those relationships are now for the better. Because they're rooted for once and finally in authenticity and in honesty. And that's always a good thing. The other thing that's good is that those experiences, that experience of being afraid and of being alone and of being different and other, 
has probably been the greatest single influence in my life up to this point as to what I've done academically and professionally and how I hope that I just tend to treat people day in and day out in my life. Being different, knowing what that feels like to be hated or disliked simply for who you are has been the single sort of spark that has fired up my desire to do social justice in the world. And so, here we are tonight, May 7th, March 7th, uh, 2018, and I'm giving a TED Talk about all this, which feels um, pretty surreal, actually. Here I am, a gay, white, Appalachian, Christian guy, standing up here talking to you about this. And... It feels like a new day is possible for me, and it feels like a new day is possible for our community. Because here's the thing, folks. I love who I am, and I love where I'm from. I love being Appalachian. It's one of the things that makes me most proud. And I see our community, I see our region becoming more diverse in a whole lot of ways, but I also see our region and our community struggling with how to be more diverse. I see our community struggling with not just tolerating diversity, but with to, with to embrace it. And it is my earnest hope that I can play some simple part, maybe even tonight, of being a part of that change. And things are better. I really believe that. They're better for my life, and I think they're better for a lot of people's lives these days. But I also think they can be a lot better than they are. Because, see, here's the truth, folks. I still worry when I take our car to the shop or when we have to have a repairman come to the house. I still worry about what they might do or think when they find out that two men are married and live together in that house. I don't want to feel like that. Things can be better. I can make things better by showing up. I want to show up to the moments that are important to each one of you in your lives. I want to show up to the moments that are important to the life of our community. I can make things better by choosing to educate myself about the things that I don't understand. I can make things better by speaking out when I see injustice happening. I can make things better by being honest and by living my authentic life. You can make things better by showing up with me to those moments that matter for other people. You can make things better by living your authentic life, by being who you are. But it's also important to know that if who you are still needs to be hidden in some way, because it might make you unsafe to be out, whether that's a sexual orientation or religious identity or anything else, also know that it's okay to, to come out on your own terms because your safety is ultimately what's most important. You can make things better by also choosing to educate yourself, not just about things that are interesting to you, but about some things that make you really uncomfortable. And by choosing to build relationships with people who are very, very different from you. And we, together, can make things better by celebrating difference. By celebrating diversity. Not just putting up with it, not just tolerating it. And for what it's worth, tolerance, tolerating, is one of my least favorite words in the world. I don't want you to put up with the person that's sitting beside you. I want you to celebrate and love them for who they are. And for us to understand as well that diversity is not just a nice thing that looks good on a brochure, but it is something that is vital and critical to the life of our communities. And we can make things better by challenging racism, by challenging sexism, homophobia, Islamophobia, whatever it is. When we see it rear its ugly head in the world, Call it out. But here's the other important thing, folks. Call it out in yourself. Because it's all something that we have to work on. So I'm going to circle back and end up soon. 
at the beginning of this, I told you kind of a tough story, right? I told you a story about a little kid who was really, really afraid. A little kid who was really unsure of who they were. And my story is unique because it's mine, but it's also not that unique. Every one of you in this room have had an experience where you were the other, where you were on the outsides, where you know what it feels like to be different. And hopefully remembering those kinds of experiences can be motivation enough to not do that to other people. My story has changed. Tonight my husband's in the audience. My parents are in the audience. My family and friends are in the audience. And finally, and over the past few years, people know me. Finally. Remember I always said for my, throughout my whole childhood, people couldn't know who I am. Now they know. Finally. They know. And because they know me, they also love me. Finally, they know. And just like I asked you to remember that time when you have understood yourself to be the other, I also want you to think about right now that person in your life who knows you better than anyone else. The person, when you are with them, you know that they know you inside and out. Think on that sense of belonging, that feeling of warmth, that feeling of being known. Be that for other people. Be that kind of a person for me when you see me walking up and down the sidewalk if you're Emory people. Because I'm going to be that for you, okay? And by doing that, by being those kinds of folks that let people know that they are known and loved and embraced for who they are, we can make things better. Because no kid should have to cower under their comforters in the days before high school, wondering how they're going to survive. No one of you in this room tonight should have to think about how to hide who you are in the presence of others. Every one of us deserves to be known, and every one of us deserves to belong. And we can know that because we tell each other that you deserve that. Because, folks, here's the truth. You are welcome here. And you deserve to be known for who you are in the fullness and richness of your humanity. And you can also swing your arms any way you damn well please. Thank you. Thank you.